Also, a Andrew King. <laughs> A uh, lot of kissing in Chile. We don't kiss as much in the, unfortunately, and even if I made a joke about that in the US, I'd be put in jail. So, um, uh, fortunately, hopefully this is not being beamed back to America. So, well, I've got a very uh, uh, sort of modest, modest uh, challenge today in the next hour, how to fix the financial future, um, which I kind of like because it's a play on my book, my last book, How to Fix the Future. Um, but let me be clear about fixing the financial future. Is, um, I'm from Silicon Valley, but even I wouldn't have the nerve to argue that we can all fix our financial futures. Um, the idea of and I know this is a, an event about technology and the way technology is changing your industry and broader industries uh, in general. Um, the idea that technology can solve our financial futures is, of course, a classically kind of uh, utopian trope, a Silicon Valley utopian trope, that technology can make us all prosperous that we won't have money problems in the future somehow because of technology. Or perhaps even more absurdly, there'll be a financial cornucopia on the horizon uh, that we'll all have infinite amount of money and we'll all live happily ever after. Um, it's, of course, a children's story. We, in, the, in the previous, uh, not this one, but the one before, we had some ads from banks presenting everyone as children. Um, and Silicon Valley is very good at that, presenting people as children and assuming that we believe fairy stories. So the idea of solving our financial future is itself, I would say, not that I'm undermining my own presentation uh, or trying not to, but it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fairy story. The, the challenges of financial independence, of feeding oneself, um, of having enough money to live a good life, these are perhaps even more um, salient, paramount problems of our digital age than they were of our 20th century, I don't know what you want to call it, industrial, managerial, modern period. Uh, I'm in a sense, from the future. Uh, I'm from San Francisco, the Bay Area. Some of you have been there. And the future at the moment doesn't look very good. I was talking to Chris, a um, fellow, he's, I think he's speaking later. We were, he's from um, Warsaw and London. We were talking about San Francisco, and he said he likes coming. And uh, yeah, it's a great place. Many of you have perhaps been. Most of you would like to go. I would certainly advise you to go to San Francisco. Um, like San, uh, like San, uh, Santiago, it's a, a very elegant place, a place full of wonderful restaurants. doesn't have the views of the mountains that you guys have, but it has the views of the bay. But also San Francisco is a warning about, again, perhaps our collective futures. It reveals the dystopian element of the digital age. When you go to San Francisco, you see many Tesla cars, you see enormous wealth, but you also see appalling poverty. It's a kind of medieval tableau of lots of Uber drivers, barely scraping by, um, multi, not only multi-millionaires who aren't taken very seriously anymore in, in the valley in, Silicon, in San Francisco, but billionaires and multi-billionaires, and then this kind of underclass, of homeless people, of drug addicts. The biggest problem in San Francisco, uh, apart from the lack of sunlight in the summer, is its increasingly large homeless population. So San Francisco, perhaps, is the future, not only of America, of the world. And we need to guard against this. I'm not going to promise that solving the financial future 
uh, will fix that. It's in, in, in some ways, that's a, a very specific American problem with its libertarian culture, its failure to create a viable state, the absence of a social security net, and the degeneration, in my view at least, of the economy into what we call a precarious economy where everyone is employed part-time. No one has full-time jobs anymore. Everyone is scraping by. So the future doesn't look good if you go to San Francisco, at least from a financial point of view, from the majority of people. And of course, we know in America that that reality is increasingly relevant um, throughout the rest of the country. The reason why so many people vote for Donald Trump is that their livelihoods, their financial livelihoods are being undermined. Uh, more and more people are living on the edge. They may not be homeless, but they're losing their full-time work, their identity, their sense of purpose. There's a drug epidemic, a kind of semi-legal drug ep epidemic driven by the pharmaceutical industry in America. Uh, I just saw a headline in the New York Times this morning that there is a 300% rise in bankruptcies of people ab above 65 over the last 15 years. So three times more people, three times more retirees are going bankrupt uh, because of this new economy. So let's not be under any illusions about how digital technology is making the world a better place. In many ways, it isn't. In many ways, um, we have an increasingly sort of binary style economy and culture in which you have a tiny group of extremely wealthy people, extremely globalized, uh, people who are very comfortable uh, in their lifestyles, in their livelihoods, in their ways of life, uh, and the rest of humanity. We're seeing, in many ways, the disappearance of the middle. Um, now, it's important, I, well, what I want to do in this, I've got quite a lot of time, more time than I normally have, um, what I want to do is lay out a kind of a, a brief snapshot of the history of the digital revolution, of the disruption all around us, the disruption now affecting your industry. Talk about the problems, talk about broader solutions, and then um, try to focus on the financial industry itself to give you some ideas, ideas that will make your businesses more successful, but also your societies better. Because ultimately, successful businesses don't always benefit society, and my work tends to focus on that. I, I'm, I don't want to represent myself as an expert on the financial industry. I'm not. I think I've been invited here to give a broader view and some lessons, some broader lessons, some intuitive lessons about what we can learn from the past as we move forward. So I, as I said, I heard that uh, presentation uh, in English uh, uh, earlier today, and the language was quite interesting. It talked about disruption and cultural empowerment and personal empowerment, and essentially how everyone can be happy. Um, now, in a sense, that's marketing, of course, and you never want to advertise yourself as a product or a service or a bank that makes people miserable. Uh, unless you're myself, of course. Uh, I actually have an association with a, a European uh, managerial group called Segeti, uh, and uh, they made me their chief unhappiness officer, so I'm, uh, I'm proud of that title. Um, some of you probably want to be, your, at least in your organizations, your chief happiness officer. I've been around this digital revolution for a while. I was lucky or unlucky enough to find myself in San Francisco in the mid-1990s. I was a kind of washed-up music journalist. Um, and so, like so many other people in the mid-90s, I stumbled on the digital revolution. We didn't quite know what was going on back in the 90s. I guess in some ways we still don't know what's going on. But back then, it was all incredibly exciting. There was this technology, and of course, you're told at this event and many other events like this that technology is changing your industry, that you need to become technology companies. 
And technology is indeed changing everything. Back in the 90s, with the birth of the internet, or at least the commercial internet, the internet had been around since the end of the Second World War, but it only really got commercialized in the early 1990s. We had an explosion of new businesses. It's what one might call Web 1.0, companies like Amazon and America Online. I myself had a small failed startup called Audio Cafe that focused on music. We were told back then, and not only we were told, we were doing the telling because everything was very new, everything was very young, so you could basically say anything you liked and no one could disprove you. We saw technology as being empowering in the way that uh, technology is presented at events like this. That technology would be good for the individual, that this new technology would be what technologists would call distributed. It didn't have a center. It would do away with the, the top-down nature of traditional industrial life. Of course, the top-down architecture um, of the banking system, in particular, is antithetical with it. Your centralized banks, your centralized hierarchies and organizations, both within the financial sector generally and within banks. This is about the most traditional, most... Um, orthodox of in industrial, managerial, and economic architectures. Uh, we were told that all that, or, and we, as I said, we were doing the telling, we, were, we saw the internet, because it was distributed, because it didn't have a center, because it, to use a, a, a much overused word, because it would disrupt everything, we saw this as being good, exciting. Of course, it was good for entrepreneurs because it gave us great opportunities to disrupt traditional industries, to disrupt traditional companies. In the music business, of course, we wanted to do away with the labels. We thought the labels were exploitative, that they took all the money off the table, that they stopped talent being distributed. So the beautiful thing about the digital revolution up front seemed to be that it would be good for everyone. It would be good for creatives, because everyone would be able to record and use the internet to distribute their work. It was good for the audience because the content would be cheap, if not free. It would be good for the culture. We would see an eruption of innovation, of creativity. It would be good for the economy. Firstly, because it would create a more level playing field. So you'd have more entrepreneurs having more opportunity. It was also good in, 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 in the sense, in, in economic terms, that it would create jobs more opportunities, more this, this, this technological disruption or this new technology would empower all of us as employees, as entrepreneurs, as consumers, as citizens. This was and, and still remains the ideology of the future, the, the ideology that the marketing machines of Silicon Valley use to legitimize, and art to legitimize their companies, to legitimize their revolution, and articulate their interests. Now, of course, as some of you are probably thinking, it's rather coincidental and very convenient that these companies got extremely rich, enormously rich, unimaginably rich, and at the same time, supposedly made the world a better place. The future then was glorious. It was presented in Silicon Valley in glorious terms, in utopian terms. In my book, How to Fix the Future, I use the sort of the metaphor of utopia to, to discuss and describe what's happened. This is my fourth book. Uh, many, of, many of my other books also talk about the same thing. The promise. But of course, the promise and the reality were quite different. The promise was of more jobs, a more level playing field, more personal dignity, more personal empowerment, more equal spread of wealth, um, that technology would make the world a better place, that the future then would be glorious. We should look forward to the future. The future would be better than the past. That narrative, classic American narrative, particularly a Western American narrative, that as time passed, things would get better. The world was improving, particularly through new technology. Now, of course, over the last 25 years, it's become increasingly clear that that actually is not the case. 
Now, one can argue, I'm not going to claim, you know, I'm as, I'm as wired as anybody else. I carry around a supercomputer in my pocket. I live off the network. I make my living off the network. So I'm not presenting myself as a Luddite. I'm not suggesting that technology is inevitably bad or has been bad. It's been very empowering. I can't imagine a life, I certainly can't imagine my current life without technology. But that doesn't mean that the promise of this digital revolution has actually been realized. That doesn't mean that the, the utopian future, the, the, the future that was promised us, has or is being realized. I'm talking, of course, in a week where we have the first trillion dollar company. Now, the internet connection here isn't very good, so I was trying to look up the GDP of Chile. Does anyone know it? You're all bankers, you should know it. What is it? Anyone have any idea? What is it? 20, no, what's the, the overall GDP? I mean, what's the country kind of worth? How, how, many, how many chilies could Apple buy? Or how many chi 250 billion. So in other words, Apple now is four times more valuable than chili. Which, uh, you know, Apple could buy four chilies. I don't know if there are four chilies in the world. Probably could buy most of Latin America. You could probably add Brazil. I don't suppose that's worth very much, or less and less these days. You know the old joke about Brazil, um, which I'm sure in Chile you will appreciate, is uh, Brazil is always, the Brazilian economy at least is always the future. It's always on the horizon. And I think, uh, I hope there are no Brazilians here, but it seems as if that future is even more distant now than it ever has been. Uh, Chile is a more successful economy. I guess it's probably the most successful economy in Latin America. So what we're saying, perhaps, is that Apple is worth almost all of Latin America, which isn't bad. You could just turn the whole continent into a giant iPhone, um, which you laugh nervously, maybe one day they will. Um, also talking in a week where Facebook, a remarkable company and a remarkable scary company, um, dropped 100 over, I think it was $110 billion in a single day in the stock market. So we were promised this level playing field. We were promised lots of startups. We were promised a wealth of new innovation. We were promised that this digital revolution would empower every company to become a tech company. And of course, that's a nice idea. But to misquote George Orwell from Animal Farm, some tech companies are bigger than other tech companies. And the reality over the last 25 years in a winner-take-all digital economy is we've had not a leveling of the playing field, but actually a dramatic, almost a, uh, an unheard of concentration of economic and cultural power. The four or five most highly capitalized companies in the world now are all tech companies. Google, is, uh, Google and Amazon are hot on the heels of Apple in becoming um, trillion dollar companies. Microsoft has also sort of somehow been resurrected. Facebook is trailing behind because of its various crises. But you put these four or five companies together, and they not only could buy Latin America, but Africa and most of Asia too. In other words, these are unheard of, unheard of powerful companies. Companies that in many respects are more powerful than the, than the, than the, than the states in, in which markets they do their business. Um, that doesn't mean they're bad companies. Apple, in many ways, is, I think, a quite a good company. It means well in most ways. But like a huge dinosaur or a huge monster of some sort, even if, it's, even if it, it, it means well, it inevitably treads on things and people whenever it stumbles around. And the same, of course, is true of all these large tech companies. What we have, then, in the digital economy is a winner-take-all economy. Now, I don't want to scare you, and I'm not suggesting that all independent banks are going out of business. But it's important to remember that this so-called blockchain revolution or the Bitcoin revolution, the very revolution that you've been hearing about, the decentralization of uh, financial power, this is also being promised in terms of doing away with the authority of central banks, creating more innovation, more currencies, more opportunities. 
whether it's Bitcoin or, or Ethereum or all these other digital currencies emerging. It kind of reminds me of the early 90s, actually, the language being used in the ICO community in terms of digital currencies. We're, we're, we're always presented, well, we do away with the central authority. We're going to create more innovation. More people will have more opportunities with currency. It will empower people. It will be good for all of us. It will do away with the middleman. It will do away with the elites. It will do away with the central bankers. It will do away with the unaccountable banking executives who have been exploiting their clients for so long, their customers for so long. We heard that in the 90s. We heard it with the music industry. We heard it with the labels. And then what happened with the music industry is firstly you had the sort of ransacking of the music industry by a sort of a, a kleptocratic uh, technological uh, so-called innovation of, uh, of Napster. And then the concentration of power. Today the most powerful music company is not in Hollywood, is not a label, it's YouTube. It's Apple. They dominate the music industry like no company has ever done before. So it's important to note that this concentration of power is your future, for better or worse. Doesn't make it bad, but it's something that you have to acknowledge. And of course, it's globalized. These companies are globally powerful. Uh, Google has re-entered the Chinese market. The Chinese themselves have a handful of companies that are now competing with these Silicon Valley leviathans. But there's nothing in Chile. You may boast of a few startups, but you will not have companies, technology companies, that will be able to compete with these global leviathans. And the same is true throughout the rest of the world. There are no African companies. There aren't really any European companies able to compete. Um, there certainly aren't any Russian. There are Chinese for various historic and, and, and economic reasons. So the promise of a level playing field hasn't been realized. We have the reality of a concentration of power. Massively powerful companies, trillion dollar companies. Now people are saying, well, Apple got to a trillion first. Who's going to get to tr two trillion? And with the new technologies, in the pipeline on the, on the horizon, really, really powerful disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence, perhaps like blockchain. Perhaps the, 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 the race to two trillion will be a much shorter one than the race to a trillion. The same, of course, is true of individual wealth. Jeff Bezos now is not only the richest man in the world, but the richest man in the history of the world. The last count, he was worth $150 billion. In other words, you can almost buy chili personally and come and live in it and throw all of you out. Uh, again, you laugh nervously. Maybe he'll do that, although he seems to be more interested in colonizing space and perhaps inhabiting his own planet. Um, Bezos, I don't know how long he took to get his first $50 billion, took, you know, few years. To get his second 50 billion took a year, uh, took, sorry, took many years. The, 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 the second 50 billion took a few years. This last 50 billion has taken a few months. Now, of course, it reflects the ups and downs of the stock market. And you can't, you know, even Jeff Bezos can't spend $150 billion. Um, and no doubt there'll be fluctuations. It will go up and down. But the reality, of course, is that what we have is a new breed of enormously wealthy, powerful individuals. I think when you put together the nine wealthiest billionaires in Silicon Valley, and I don't include Bezos, because he's not a Silicon Valley, he's a, he's a Seattle and a Washington DC multi-billionaire. When you put together their wealth, they're collectively worth what the two and a half billion poorest people in the world are worth. So you have dramatic imbalances. This is something that's more and more Paramount. I don't know who the richest person in Chile is, and I don't know whether this is reflected in your socioeconomic infrastructure. But this is an important reality of the financial future, more and more economic imbalance. So the promise of the wealth being shared has not been realized. You just need to go to San Francisco and see all the homeless people, uh, the ex cops, the ex-nurses and teachers and, and workers and, and, and military people lying on the streets and sleeping in their cars to understand this. And I, I'm not going to tell you how to fix that financial future because that's probably the subject 
uh, of, a, of at least a two-hour speech. Um, but it is a reality. So the promise of this shared wealth hasn't been realized. What about the power of the consumer? Now, of course, we've all got these devices, and they're great. They're very empowering. We can communicate with anyone we like. We can go on Facebook. We can look anything up on, fair, on Google. Uh, if I'd have had internet access here, I could have figured out what Chile's GDP was. Before Google, I would have had to have gone to the library. Now, of course, particularly in America, there aren't any libraries, so we're reliant on Google. This is a good thing, of course. It's a wonderful thing. And from a financial point of view, the technology which allows me to look up how much money or how little money I have all the time is also a good thing. Uh, so the Internet has empowered me in some ways. But there's a, there's a big problem. The problem, of course, is of privacy and autonomy in the industrial age, we were guaranteed security. I heard that word earlier today. We were guaranteed privacy. When we communicated, when we did our business in the world, when we went into a store, we bought things. We exchanged cash for bread, for cars, for rent. The economy of Silicon Valley is a very different economy. We, of course, I could have looked up the GDP of Google, oh, sorry, whoops, that was a Freudian error. I, I could have looked up the GDP of Chile on Google. Wouldn't have cost me anything, it would have been a free service. I didn't have to buy any books. I didn't have to pay Google to do this. It's free, it seems almost like magic. But of course, it's not really magic because when I do that on Google, Google knows I'm in Chile. So it might happen that I'll start seeing advertisements for Chilean hotels or restaurants. When I do that on Facebook, I see the same sorts of things. I'm not on Facebook, but if I was on Facebook and I made announcements about what I'm doing, Facebook would know more and more about me. The new business model then of most of the dominant Silicon Valley companies is the so-called free model of turning us as consumers, as users, into products. So we're the schmucks, we're the people sitting around that poker table when you have, you know, you know, you all know that old story when you're sitting around a poker table and you don't know who the full person is, it's you. And it's all of us in this new economy. Sure, Facebook is, uh, so sure, Google is almost worth a hundred billion dollars. But surveillance is the reality. Google is free. The vast majority of Google's revenue, I think over 95%, is advertising revenue. And the reason why Google is such a successful advertising company is because every time we use its product, they know more about us. They know so much about us that they can predict our futures better than we can. Eric Schmidt, their former CEO, um, executive chairman, even once said that to the FT. He said, what do you want Google to be a few years ago? Where do you want Google to be? He said, I want it to be so smart that it knows what we want, what jobs we want, what we want to do before we know it ourselves. Google is an early example of an AI company, but that is essentially the AI industry captured in a snapshot. AI is technology that knows about us. It's so smart, it's smarter than we are. The consequence, of course, of all this in terms of the future, in terms of this new economy, is that our privacy is being undermined, our autonomy. The very thing that, say, 19th century theorists of democracy, like John Stuart Mill, uh, the English political philosopher, or American jurists like Louis Brandeis, all believed that our autonomy was essential to create good citizens, and to maintain our freedom, the essence of democracy is being undermined. So this new economy, whilst it gives us free services, is, in my view at least, um, deeply detrimental to us as human beings. We're selling our souls for free stuff. We're selling literally our sense of who we are we are revealing everything about ourselves on the network, so we get these services for free. Julian Assange, the guy who now is stuck in the uh, Ecuadorian embassy, the, the founder of WikiLeaks, 
I don't much care for him generally, but uh, he, he did say some good things. And he said about uh, Facebook, he said, if, if the CIA was smart enough to come up with a tech startup, they would have invented Facebook. And we know now with Facebook that, you know, that I'm not some sort of miserable bastard here telling you how awful it is. This is being revealed on a daily basis. It's why Facebook st stock dropped $110 billion in a single day, a record on Wall Street, record for any stock market because they are mining our data. The free economy then doesn't work. Whatever you're told at some of these tech events, when you have some tech evangelist saying, well, everyone can win in the free economy, you give your consumers, your users, free services. Don't believe them. There is no free lunch. You know that as bankers. And technology doesn't change basic rules. It doesn't change the nature of power elites, money, nothing really changes. This is all old wine in new bottles. So the new economy is, sure, it's disruptive, sure, it has some benefits, but ultimately, in my view, it's been a failure, and people are beginning to wake up to that, beginning to understand that we've sold ourselves in, in exchange for what? Some, uh, a free search engine or a free social network, or you know, uh, interesting new, and, and we're seeing that surveillance not only in the free economy, but also in the paid economy. Amazon, for example, Amazon is not so much in the free economy. Amazon has dominated e-commerce and now dominates web services. But Amazon is a company that has premised its business on surveillance. So Amazon is pioneering new surveillance technologies as a company in which everyone is watched. You as bankers will be peddled new technologies, which will say, well, we can watch your workers, we can quantify your workers, we can make sure they don't waste any time. We can weed out the lazy, the people who spend their time on Facebook or browsing, the people who aren't productive. People are always used to talk about um, uh, the, the, the convergence of countries like China and Russia and America in democracy. But actually, there's a new convergence happening. The Chinese are perfecting a, a kind of surveillance Orwellian system where everyone is being watched all the time and rewarded for their political um, loyalty. Um, Amazon's doing the same thing in the workplace. What we have then is technology enabling... Uh, uh, what I call digital tailorism, where everyone is being watched all the time. So the dignity of labor is being undermined in some ways by technology. And of course, the dignity of labor is also being undermined in our precarious economy. The so-called sharing economy of Uber and Airbnb reflects bigger economic realities. Fewer and fewer people have full-time jobs. Fewer and fewer people um, are employed by, say, banks or utilities or large companies throughout their life. Everyone is becoming an entrepreneur. Now, that's an opportunity for you, but it's also an economic reality where the guys who are driving for Uber or renting out their homes on Airbnb, they're not getting rich. It's only the owners of Uber, which is worth now $80 billion, or Airbnb, which are benefiting from this, because they're taking huge amounts of the revenue. So it's not just our privacy that is being undermined by this new digital economy, but our dignity of labor. Now, that wasn't always the case. We know the history of industrialization is also the history of labor exploitation from the work of 19th century writers like Marx and many others. The history of capitalism certainly hasn't been glorious. Uh, you know, Chile has its own unique take on that. But at least people had full-time jobs. Technology is supposedly empowering people to be able to drive Uber cabs or rent out their spare rooms on Airbnb. But you ask the person who's barely earning minimum income driving their Uber car, or the people so desperate for income that they're having to invite strangers into their home to make sure that their kids can eat or are fed or are clothed. It's, it's a different kind of situation. So what about jobs? Well, jobs is great in a way. I guess this, the part-time economy is good. 
It's better that people have work than don't have work. I acknowledge that. And no one's being forced to rent their rooms out on Airbnb or drive an Uber cab. But of course, the real jobless dystopia is, is on the horizon. AI is a very exciting technology in many ways, but in other ways, it's deeply disruptive and disturbing. Most economists predict that 40 to 50 percent of current jobs will go away over the next 10 to 15 years through the AI revolution. That is the next big thing. And it's not just fast food workers. Last week I was in uh, Chicago talking an event, talked to a guy from Burger King. I said, how much of a reality is this? this, this fast food restaurant without workers? They said, we're already doing it. It's not just fast food workers. It's not just cab drivers with self-driving cars. It's not just personal assistants, but it's lawyers and doctors, the very backbone of our 19th and 20th century um, expert economy. AI replaces, now I'm not sure if an AI, for better or worse, could make this kind of speech, um, but AI replaces doctors and lawyers and bankers. Now, I'm not saying none of you will have jobs in 10 to 15 years, but look at the reports of serious economists. I interviewed, I interviewed a number of them for my last book. They all have the same conclusion, that most of the jobs that we take for granted in our industrial, managerial, top-down system, the very system that you're part of, will go away through AI. That is the new narrative. That's the big story of the future. And of course, cultural discord is self-evident. I'm from America. We have the first internet president, not Obama. Trump is the first internet president because he's an extreme narcissist who uses technology not for understanding or sympathy or wisdom, but to bash his enemies. And most of, uh, most of the world seems to be his enemy. So this New technology was supposed to make us more social, more sympathetic, more understanding. Now, of course, it, in some ways it does. It allows us to communicate with our friends around the world. That's true. It introduces us to other people and other cultures. That's true. But it also is spawning an increasingly misanthropic media, hatred against women, people of color, religious minorities, increasing discord between political communities. We have the fracturing of the civic understanding which drove 19th and 20th century societies. And I think countries like America are now teetering on violence. Uh, last week, um, a, a noted American, uh, a noted columnist, Brett Stevens of the New York Times, who's a conservative, he's, he's no friend of the left, a traditional conservative, suggested that after Trump's latest speech against the media, that Trump will have blood on his hands when some crazy follower of his assassinates some CNN reporter or newspaper reporter because Trump, through social media, particularly through Twitter, has categorized all media people as enemies of the people, again, Orwellian language, inciting people to violence. So what are we going to do about all this? We, how to fix this future? Now, the, fi the future is broken, but that doesn't mean it's inevitably broken. doesn't mean we can't fix it. These birth pains of digital society are rather like the very birth pains that we went through in the Industrial Age. I write about this in my book. We can fix this, but it's going to take a lot of effort a lot of time, a lot of concentration. It can't be done through technology. Don't rely on technology. So when you're listening to this and think, well, is there a new technology that can figure this stuff out? You may come to one of these conferences and listen to someone like Don Tapscott, a friend of mine from Canada, an expert on blockchain. He will tell you, well, the solution is blockchain. Blockchain does away with this. Blockchain makes the playing field level. Blockchain enables transparency. Blockchain is the new internet, the new thing that changes everything. But actually, blockchain in many ways will only compound all this because the winner-take-all nature of technology is a reality. It doesn't make technology bad, but that's just the truth we have to live with. 
Technology is not the solution for this. Only people can fix this. Only we as humans can fix our future. And our challenge is particularly paramount in the age of AI, where we've invented technology that replicates much of what we do. Um, some technologists, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, fear that AI will eventually, or maybe not even eventually, will in the short term create self-conscious technology, technology with a soul, technology that can think for itself. And of course, that technology will think faster, deeper, better, smarter than ourselves, so that our future is one of technological slavery, where we've created, in a, in a Frankenstein-like narrative, we've created the very technology that will kill us. Now, that may be true, and if it is, we're probably wasting our time. I'm not sure that is true. It's more of a, a Hollywood script, a Hollywood dystopian script than a reality. But we need to fix this stuff. We need to fix this stuff before this stuff fixes us. We need to address these inequalities this threat to employment, this destruction of privacy, this winner-take-all economy. So how do we do it? We do it as we've always done, by traditional tools. In my book, I, I, I talk about five tools. The first is regulation. The Silicon Valley model is a, a sort of a libertarian utopianism that suggests that technology works without the government, that if the government stays out, the government's slow, the government doesn't get it, so just leave those old guys out of it, and we'll fix everything. When, of course, they haven't fixed everything. In America, the government has stayed out. There is no antitrust in America. So you have these gigantic companies that are basically unaccountable. Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Amazon. There are no antitrust investigations in, in the US. No ways of regulating these, country, these companies. So again, it's left to the rest of the world to do it. In my book, I look at Europe not as stumbling behind America in innovation, but actually leading innovation. I spent some time with a woman called Margaret Vestager, who's the EU Commissioner of Antitrust. She's the one who fined Google several billion dollars for its monopolistic practices, its illegal monopoly. There's not, a mono, a being a monopoly isn't illegal. What's, Illegal is using one of your monopolies to further your interests in other markets, and that's exactly what Google is doing. Vestager was the woman who fined Apple $12 billion for not paying its taxes in Europe. Tim Cook, who's generally a nice guy, stumbled out of his meeting with Vestager saying it was the worst meeting of his life, which was a good thing because the trillion-dollar company was made accountable by politicians because that's all we have ultimately. We don't have anything else. There is no distributed network that can control these companies. There's nothing else that can act for citizens, for the public interest. So what's going on in Europe, whether it's antitrust investigations of these large companies, whether it's new laws like the GDPR that is recalibrating data and privacy, um, to make sure that consumers are empowered with their own data so that we're not watched all the time perpetually by these technology giants, whether it's the work of the German government, which is forcing Facebook to become accountable as a media company, which it is, and fining Facebook billions, hundreds of millions of dollars every time it enables the publication of offensive or illegal material. The regulatory initiative is coming from Europe. That's where, I know maybe some of you, there are some public officials here, that's where you should be looking, not to America. America is a broken political system. America is a system where private corporations have essentially become more powerful than the state. And the state, for many other reasons, has retreated. And now you have the crisis of Trump, and there are more and more serious things to consider about the democratic system. The system is no longer working in America, but it is working in Europe. And I had several conversations with Vestager, and her language was of leveling the playing field. Now, true, of course, in some ways, perhaps she wants to empower Ameri uh, Brit uh, uh, Europe. I said British, I, unfortunately, no longer part of the EU, uh, or won't be. Uh, uh, Vestager wants to empower European entrepreneurs, to stimulate European businesses. That's a good thing. And that's what you should be doing in Chile, too, as 
uh, as the leading sort of technology incubator, as a center of innovation and entrepreneurialism. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of relying on regulators not to create some sort of inefficient Stalinist system where everything's controlled by the state. That obviously is an inevitable failure and an injustice. But the state needs to act to level the playing field. So regulation is really important. Innovation is also really important. In broad terms, what we're seeing is um, what we're seeing is uh, new companies emerging, particularly in Europe, that are trying to call to, to do what I call redecentralizing power, redecentralizing company, creating networks, social networks, social businesses without a center, without the Uber or the YouTube, the sort of the, 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 the large, huge, the large company at the center taking an, an unjustifiably large cut of, 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 of the thing. So what you have are new technologies, truly decentered technologies, and this may be an opportunity in the financial industry, really innovative technologies that will create genuine peer-to-peer -peer technologies. Companies like Uber and Airbnb claim to be peer-to-peer, -peer, but there's a huge Uber or a huge Airbnb between the P and the P. They're taking 30 or 40 percent of the exchange. So what we need, for example, are cab companies, self-driving companies, that will automatically connect the driver and the person who wants to be driven. And we're seeing this as a reality. So we need innovation, we need regulation, we also need more consumer power. Consumers need to stand up aggressively for their own rights. We're beginning to see this in terms of this pushback against surveillance culture. That's why Facebook dropped $110 billion. This should be a warning to you as bankers, by the way. Don't buy the free idea. Don't buy the idea that the millennial generation or the kids don't care about the privacy. That's absolute garbage. That's the unwisdom of old people. Um, it's really important to remember that, that consumers are beginning to acquire a voice. The same happened, of course, in the industrial economy. In my book, I talk about how it changed the nature of the food industry and the car industry. I use the car industry as a warning to large American companies. In the 50s, the American car industry dominated the world economy. Then they, started, they became arrogant. They started to disregard the interests of consumers. And they started to create death traps as cars. Ralph Nader famously wrote about this in 1965 in his book, Unsafe at Any Speed. Um, and that resulted um, in the decimation of the car industry, the American car industry, and the rise of the German and Japanese car industries that focused on the consumer. So we need consumers demanding rights through things like GDPR, through moving, through not, not, not using companies like Facebook or Google, that exploit them, that turn them into product. And as I said, this is the beginning of this. We will see more and more of this in future. We also need more civic action. This is the big issue. These are the big issues of our age. Whether it's the philanthropic initiatives of billionaires, whether it's lawyers working on behalf of the precariat, like Uber drivers, to give them more rights, citizenship and the citizens' initiative just as in the industrial age, are what's key. And finally, we need more education. We need education about what makes us human in this digital age. Earlier, I was asked the question, what will, be the, um, what will financial workers do in the future? Of course, one idea is that financial workers will become like algorithms and that anyone who wants to go and work in the financial industry should learn to program, learn to code. But that is, a f I think, is a myth. I think it's really important to remember that the future of work will be focused on things that the algorithm cannot do. The algorithm is, for better or worse, the reality of the future of economy. It's, it's what will reshape, which will profoundly disrupt industries as diverse as yours and healthcare and every other industry. But the algorithm can't do everything. 
The algorithm doesn't know how to make a speech like this. The algorithm doesn't know how to listen. The algorithm doesn't know how to be ambivalent, how to be sympathetic, how to be empathetic. The algorithm can't really give financial advice, financial advice that isn't self-evident, financial advice that isn't analytical. The algorithm can't look at a customer in the eye and talk to them about their financial challenges, about whether or not they should get a mortgage, about whether or not they should save, about how to send their kids through school, about how to survive. So the future of education should be in educating people in those areas, in what it means to be human. The school system of the industrial age kind of was a top-down system that encouraged us to, to, to learn stuff by heart because we didn't have Googles, because we didn't have the algorithm to fall back on. So in a sense, the old industrial, the old education system was training us all to be rather inadequate algorithms. But now we have algorithms that kill us, that outrun us. And this is just the beginning of these super algorithms. As computer speeds and technologies and chips become ever more smart, soon we will have chips embedded in ourselves. We, in a sense, I guess, will become like algorithms. But we can still compete. And what I talk about in my book, in the chapter on education, are new kinds of, well, not even that new, old new kind of education systems, like the, the Waldorf system in, in Germany that has now been exported in the world, that focuses on what it means to be human, in teaching children to learn how to develop goals, not to use devices, not to become calculating machine. So what does this mean for you, very briefly, on the financial industry? The first, as I said, is don't believe the hype. Let's talk very briefly about Bitcoin. We're told that blockchain will democratize, that the, this decentralized new financial system, these digital currencies, will do away with the authority of the central bank. In a sense, that's true, but it won't result in a multiplicity of new technologies, of new currencies. What it will do will concentrate power. It's no coincidence, by the way, that the Chinese dominate the blockchain market, that most of the Bitcoin, uh, most of Bitcoin is, and you know, Bitcoins are manufactured by computers, most of Bitcoin value is being created in China. So the reality of new digital currencies is the concentration of power. That's why regulation is so important. And of course, what blockchain is doing is empowering criminals. It's empowering the dark net. It's empowering people to disrupt the system. Uh, the Russians have been very good about this. I, I have a long relationship, or not so long, uh, sort of a, uh, like most people, sort of a weird relationship with the Russians. I spoke at some of their events. Uh, now, I, I was in London a few months ago. One of my old Russian contacts showed up. He said, we're putting on events about blockchain. We believe blockchain to be the future. It's great. Will you participate in our conferences? And it occurred to me, why are the Russians such big fans of blockchain? Of course, they're big fans because it disrupts the Western economic system, because it undermines the central bank, because it empowers the kleptocracy in Moscow and the criminal gangs who this kleptocracy funds. So don't be afraid of regulation. The Americans may not do it. They don't have the will. They don't have the balls. And given the American system is falling apart, it may lie on regulators from smaller countries, like Chile, or certainly from Europe and from Asia, to lead this regulation. Don't believe the hype. What does it mean in terms of being a future financial worker? As I said, I, I'm not sure I was asked another question. What, what's the future of banks? Are there going to be banks? I'm not sure there will be physical banks but there'll still be a need for financial advice. Indeed, in terms of this increasingly turbulent financial future, where we won't have full-time jobs, where we'll all become entrepreneurs for better or worse, where we'll be continually marketing and self-marketing ourselves on the new networks, on selling our services, where some of our skills will become outdated almost as soon as we learn them, I think financial advice becomes even more paramount because our financial futures as individuals is increasingly uncertain. But the algorithm doesn't solve that. These bottom-end algorithm products are worthless. They're exploitative. Now, I fear the disappearance of the middle in financial services, like in so many other industries. 
But the reality is focusing on the human, because we're not becoming less human in the future of the algorithm. We're not becoming machines, and we need advice. We need personalization. We need empathy. So whether or not it's in a physical bank, sure, we'll get our cash from machines. Maybe there won't even be cash. Maybe this will become our digital wallet. It already has in many ways. I don't think that changes that much for the financial industry in terms of your value. But what it does mean is that financial advice, I think, becomes more and more paramount. And it can't be scaled. It needs to be personalized. And we'll see the convergence of financial industries. You need to see everyone, you know, you were told earlier, well, everyone's a tech company. That's scary. Because now your direct competition is Google and Apple. These are potential digital banks. If these companies with their trillion or two trillion dollar valuations um, wanted to, to literally break the banks, they could. They're doing it with the insurance industry. We're seeing dramatic transformations of industries. We saw how Uber has radically changed the transportation industry. Now it's worth several times more than any car, industry, any car company. We've seen it with Airbnb and the way in which Airbnb is worth more and more than, more than any hotel chain or network. The same will be true of banks. So you need to see these companies not as friends, because they're not. They're not sympathetic. They want your lunch like any other large company. You need to learn to compete against them. Through innovation, you can't just rely on the state. You just can't rely on regulation. But you also need to work with consumers. You need to show consumers your value. You need to show why you're more valuable as a personal banker than Facebook or Google or Amazon. The retail industry failed that with Amazon. Amazon has decimated retail. I don't know if it's decimated it in Chile. Do you have Amazon here? Uh, well, not yet. You will have it. And if any of you are in the, in the retail business, beware. Uh, again, a reality. But you need to learn to compete. You need to learn from the music business that was completely decimated. 50%, and I'm from it, 50% of global sales of recorded music. Uh, disappeared between 1999, the birth of Napster, and about 2013 or 14. It's slowly coming up, but it's only coming up because of new innovative products from companies we saw earlier, like Spotify. But companies where people are paying money do not fall into the great seduction of believing in free products. You need, above all else, and this is my final point, you need to be able to Prove to your consumer, to your user, to your client, the value of paid services. You need to be able to show them that it's worth paying for your content. We're seeing this with music. Kids are now paying for Spotify because they don't want to be inundated with advertising. Kids have embraced vinyl records and handwriting. People talk about the digital natives. These are the people, and you hear this in some of these speeches, oh, they're the ones who will... They won't want to pay for anything. They're the ones who love all free stuff and give away their privacy and, and love to work with this. It's actually the real reaction against the, the Silicon Valley is going to come and is coming from the kids because they're sick of this. It's the kids who have fled Facebook. It's the kids who are paying for Spotify. It's the kids who have rediscovered vinyl records. It's the kids who are relearning how to physically write. And it's the kids who will understand when you offer them an economic proposition, that in exchange for X, you get Y. It's that simple. Because the problem with the Silicon Valley model is that's never articulated, and ultimately, the kids are being exploited. But they're not that stupid, the digital natives. They've woken up to it. In a sense, we're like back in the 1950s. The 60s, in digital terms, is yet to come. It may be incredibly violent and dangerous and scary, or it could be really creative. It's not only up to the kids, but it's up to industries like you who need to take technology, new technology, exciting technology, but repackage it in a more human way and present it to consumers and users in a more honest way that's been done so far. So that's my unhappiness message for you. Thank you. Thank you.
Muchas gracias.